Welcome back, everybody, to a new episode of Podcast on the Brink. Actually, our second episode this week. First one, obviously, previewing North Carolina earlier in the week. Indiana gets a big 77-65 win over the Tar Heels on Wednesday night. But quick turnaround to the opening of Big Ten play this Saturday at Jersey Mike's Arena, I think I believe it's now called, um, in Piscataway. To help us preview this game and talk about Rutgers and how they've played so far this season, Brian Fonseca of NJ Advanced Media and the Star Ledger is here making his debut on Podcast on the Brink. Welcome to the show, Brian. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be on with you, man. So we were talking a little bit before um, Indiana has really struggled against Rutgers. Admittedly, you know, over the last, I think it's eight matchups, they've gone one and seven. And if you listen to Indiana's postgame comments uh, the other night against uh, North Carolina, uh, Trace Jackson Davis specifically really focused on the next game and the opportunity that they have this Saturday at, at Rutgers. I, I guess just you've been around this Rutgers basketball program for a while, covered it for a while. What's it been like just seeing the the evolution of, of this program from some of those dark days where they first joined the Big Ten and, and they weren't competitive to now they're, you know, a, a respectable team in the Big Ten that I feel like is going to compete for an NCAA tournament bid year in and year out. They've got a really good coach. They've got great fan support, it seems like, at their home games. I guess two-parter, how, how surprised have you been at just kind of this turnaround long-term and and what what's it been like to just as a reporter to follow uh, the evolution of this program? Sure. So I was a student when I started this whole journalism thing. I, I was a student, and one of my first beats was the Rutgers men's basketball team, and that was the the middle of the Eddie Jordan era. Which, as any Big Ten basketball fan that watched, tuned into one of those games, aside from that huge upset they had over Wisconsin, it was just miserable, miserable basketball. I um, mean, the guy at one point said he didn't coach rebounding, and that was pretty obvious. Uh, so that the, the depths of of that program knew no there, there was there was no bottom right so uh, there was really no bar for Pico to clear but it did not seem possible that they could turn it around to where they are now especially as fast as they did we used to joke around that if Pico ever brought Rutgers to an NCAA tournament they'd build him a statue outside of the rack and that's the way it felt when they in that 2019 20 year before the pandemic ruined everything that's that's what people were feeling the the magic of that season. Uh, really encapsulated was encapsulated by just how quickly things turned around. Now it hasn't been flashy, obviously. It's very Big Ten esque the way they play. They'll grind you down, low possession, defensive, run out the clock. But it works. It works in this league. And uh Pat Hobbs, the athletic director, nailed the hire and found a guy who fits at Rutgers, fits in the Big Ten, and uh is is believes in his convictions, which has gotten them through some ugly non-conference slates and pulled through in Big Ten play. And like you said, they built themselves into a solid Big Ten program. I don't know if Rutgers is ever going to compete for a Big Ten title outside of you know one magical year at once a decade, but they're always going to be in the thick of it for the NCAA tournament. They're going for their third straight appearance for the first time in program history, which kind of shows the again the, the lack of success this program has had for a long time. Um, and it's a credit to what Pykele has built. And I think people uh, maybe the biggest credit is that. People are upset when they lose the game on the road to Miami. That that didn't happen, you know, five years ago. People just kind of took that for granted. So uh, the program has come a long way. And uh, as you mentioned, the, their re- track record against Indiana recently is another uh, uh, example of that. I don't think anybody dreamed of that happening, you know, when they joined the Big Ten. What's the fan support like there? I've never been to the rack, but I've seen some of the games on TV. It looks, I mean, it's its obviously a smaller place, but they pack it well. It seems like it's one of a really intimidating environment it can be. But just overall, how, how I guess, how invested is the Rutgers fan base in the basketball program now based on recent performance, maybe compared to, say, football or other sports on campus? Yeah, they're very invested. I think they. this is a university that's just starving for any success in any major sport. They haven't really had it for most of its history. And, and when Peigel built the program to the point where it is now, people really are clinging on, and especially where the football program is. The football program hasn't been good probably in almost a decade. So people are just just loving what Peigel has done. Uh, they love the players he brings in, the kind of personalities they they have. Uh, Ron Harper Jr. was a great example of that. I watched him play in the G League last night, and he's still the same. You know, is a great quote, a great representative. So Peigel gets players like that. Uh, he 
is a guy who interacts with the fan base and they've responded in kind. They fill that place out. Uh, like you said, it's a bit of a smaller venue, 8,000 seats. I was at assembly hall last year and, and the size of discrepancy is really notable, but they pack it in. And the way the place is built, the acoustics are that like 8,000 sound like 20,000. And I've been at all the major games in the last couple of years. Uh, the Ohio state game last year was insane. Uh, the Purdue game, obviously when they upset number one, Purdue was incredible. Seton hall. And you can't even, hear yourself think I can't talk to the guy next to me because it's so loud. And, and, and assembly hall is like that. I was there for the Rutgers game last year, like I said, and it does get really loud in there from, from what I could tell, but there's just something about the rack that I think Paul McKay, he said something about, about a five to seven points. That is what the rack gives them. And I, I totally believe that. I do think it's playing on the road in college basketball is hard everywhere. I do think there's just a little something extra about the rack, just, just the way that place is built. And uh, as, as ferocious as the fans get, because like I said, they're dying They've been dying for success for so long, so they've really been taking it out um, uh, in these last couple of years. You mentioned the name Paul Mulcahy, and that's obviously a bit of a sore spot right now for Rutgers fans because he got hurt in the first game of the season. I believe he played the next two games, maybe the third game a little bit, and then had to come out because his shoulder was bothering him. What can you tell us just in terms of his status for this weekend and beyond? Obviously, I don't think Rutgers wants to do anything um, – irresponsible and just throw him back out there before he's ready. There's a long season ahead. You don't want to just play him for one game, but he's obviously important to what they do. Uh, and Look at his assist rate last year in the Big Ten. He was among the best guys in terms of being a facilitator uh, for his team. And it, it just seems like in the little bit that I've watched Rutgers so far this season, not a lot, uh, they definitely miss his presence out there uh, and, and just kind of what he brings in terms of the intangibles to the game. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was obvious in the game against uh, Miami on Wednesday. They down the stretch, they had seven turnovers in the last thirteen minutes. They didn't get a bucket. I think they had two buckets in the last ten minutes. The offense just when it needed when it needed to score did not have a guy that can kind of slow things down, open things up, find the right guy. Cliff Omori didn't get a touch in the last ten minutes because they didn't have a point guard like Paul Mulcahy that could get him the ball. Uh, so his his his, his um, absence is very notable. It was notable in the loss to Temple. Um, so. Whether he'll play or not, I am not sure. I would not bank on it. Um, so he has a, what they're calling a stinger. Essentially, it's a pinched nerve, and it's something that is really – you can't – there's no real timeline for this. It's not like an ACL where you know you're going to be out for eight to ten months or whatever it is. Um, it's just kind of a feel thing, how much he can uh, – how much the pain is there, how he can deal with the pain. Uh, it, it's going to be tough to tell. I think the kid himself would play with one arm if they let him. He he wears he, – he dresses in his warm-ups before every game headband and all like he he if they let him play they would uh but, but the the staff the medical staff especially is being very careful with him um again i would be surprised if he played against indiana i, I, I wouldn't be shocked but i would be surprised and that's a, a big blow for Rutgers on the offensive end um they, they have a freshman point guard Derek simpson who was overwhelmed frankly in his first start against temple and he had some he had played 10 minutes against miami and struggled a bit uh camp spencer who's a transfer from loyal maryland is not is not a point guard um, they, have, they have no real ball handler that can run the offense without Paul McKay. So, um, yeah, that, that that is a big time issue. And and Rutgers will hope that if you don't, they don't get it back Saturday, they're going to need it back soon. Because by the time the Big Ten rolls around, I'm not sure they can win 10 games that they're going to need with uh, unless he comes back. Caleb McConnell, fortunately for Rutgers, is back. Uh, the last couple of games had a knee injury to start the season, but is now I saw he played 35 minutes at Miami, so that's definitely a ramp up from where he was in the first game. I took a little heat in the preseason. Uh, every year I do uh, a list with with Dylan Burkhardt of UM Hoops of our top 25 players in the Big Ten before the year. I had Caleb McConnell uh, in the top 10 of the league. Um, you look at his scoring numbers and you say, you know, he's not a great offensive player, but I look at what he does from a defensive perspective. You know, basketball is played on both ends of the floor, and I, I look at him, um, and I think he deserves all the accolades he gets for being just a, a top-notch defender. Uh, I, I've seen games where he can just take the other team's best wing player and basically reduce them to to their impact to, to very little. What What's McConnell been like coming back from injury? Does, does he still seem like he's kind of working uh, back into things? And, and is he... Kind of going to kind of be the guy that that Peichel relies on to create offense from the perimeter uh, for the team. With, with, as if, if Mulcahy's out uh, for Saturday and beyond, 
Well, well, first, you and Dylan do a great job with that stuff. I think you guys have some of the the, the sharpest insight in the Big Ten. So I just wanted to say that. And I think Michael would really appreciate your uh, your thought process that basket that defense is an important part of basketball. I think he says he says that just about every press conference. So uh, yeah, but his impact is on that end of the floor. He is. The Rutgers has been a dominant defensive team for a while under Peigel. I think he brings that to another level. That was obvious uh, towards the end of the year. I don't think I remember as obvious of a defensive player of the year candidate as he was. Um, and the last, first the first two games back from the injury, he is not exactly as fluid as he was uh, last season. But he's he's more. I was surprised at how healthy he looked. Um, he wore a brace in the first game back. I don't think he wore it against Miami, but it was tough to tell because he was wearing black black tights and uh, and it was on TV. I wasn't in Miami. Uh, but he looks healthy, as healthy as he possibly could be coming off any injury. So I don't think that's a concern. Creating offense has been kind of his off-season. That was on his off-season checklist. He wanted to grow in that area. He flashed a little bit of it against Notre Dame in the NCAA tournament. He looked decent against Miami on that end. He was hitting some tough shots. I don't know if he can be the one that creates offense. Um, and if they are depending on him to create offense, I don't know how effective they can be. Um, but it might come down to that. They're going to depend on him. They're going to depend on Cam Spencer again, who lit up all the low major teams they've played. He played out of his mind against them, struggled against Miami, struggled against Temple. I think he was one of 10 against Miami. Uh, missed some open shots. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a matter of playing on the road. I don't know if it's a matter of an elevated competition to making him play harder on the defensive end and tiring him out. I don't know what it is, but he struggled uh, to create much there, but they're going to need him to be that scorer. And then Andre Hyatt, who's a, a wing guy who's been starring in McCall's place when he was hurt. He hit some tough threes against Miami. He also has, he has this habit of committing at least one travel every game. And it seems like he's not able to string these possessions together. He'll hit one tough shot, miss an open shot, but the, Rutgers is going to have to hope that two or three of these guys have big games together without Mulcahy. Uh, this team was supposed to be less ISO oriented without Geo Baker and Ron Harper. They looked like it when Mulcahy was back. When he's not playing, it, they do revert a bit to that. So I, I do think they're going to have to hope that guys just play out of their minds. Uh, the, the, they'll be good defensively as they always are. Offensively, this team is, I think it's fair to say they're a bit challenged, especially without Mulcahy. We've made it pretty deep into the this week the show without even mentioning Rutgers best player Cliff Amori he was a, another guy we I think I had him top five entering the season we, we hear a lot of talk about Trace Jackson Davis Hunter Dickinson Zach Eady he's right there on the you know maybe a little bit behind those guys but I think deserves to be in the conversation you look at what he's doing this season uh 16.7 points per game almost 10 rebounds he's you know from watching him his first season at Rutgers to where he is now, he's he's really gotten a lot better. I feel like developed more of an offensive game. He's a, a relentless rebounder. Where have you seen him grow kind of the most between last season and this season? Is it just a matter of them getting him more touches, uh, emphasizing him more in the offense? I notice his, his usage rate has gone up uh, quite a bit, and I think that's probably a product somewhat of Harper Jr. and Baker being gone and them emphasizing him more. But is he much improved from where he was even a year ago? He, he yes. To, to, the short answer is yes. I think that when you clump him in with the, those other elite bigs in the, in the league, I think he is definitely the most athletic by far. He he really depends on that more than those other guys, whereas Dickinson, Edie, you get, you get them the ball deep in the post, they're going to finish around the rim with touch. He's much more of a physical, dunk it down your throat guy. He'll dunk balls from positions that you see him catch the ball. You're like, there's no way he's going to dunk it from here. And he's turning around and j- jumping off the catch and dunking. Uh, his touch around the rim is not as great as those guys. It hasn't gotten better, at least not much from last season. Um, he has expanded his range. He's hitting more mid-range shots. He's able to hit some threes, although not too many. I, I don't think he's hit more than one three per game, but he looks more comfortable taking those shots. Um, but when Rutgers doesn't have Mulcahy again, this was an issue against Miami. They can't really get him the ball deep in the post because guys just front him and they're not able to move the ball around to open him up. Uh, that's an issue, but... At its best, Rutgers offense does flow through Cliff. They get him the ball that th- opens things up on the perimeter and he can pass it out. Uh, but yes, he, he, he's he's expanded his game. He's gotten somehow more athletic, it looks. He's uh, become more fluid. He looks more comfortable. Um, he still has... I'm, I'm curious to see his matchup with Trace Jackson Davis defensively. 
Uh, he had a hard time against Miami six foot seven center who, uh, you know, this is a great player, Arkansas state, uh, first team, all Sunbelt, Sunbelt player of the year, but he's uh, probably a notch below trace Jackson Davis. Trace Jackson Davis looked incredible against uh, Armando Baycott. I, if, if Rutgers is to get his pull out a win, they're going to need Cliff to defend Trace Jackson Davis well and score on him. I don't know. I'm not very confident in Cliff's ability to stop Trace. Uh, that's going to be a big matchup. And he has been pretty good at not fouling. Uh, Cliff has. He's going to have to to watch his foul trouble as well because while the death behind him has been better than expected, Antonio Wolf, Antoine Wolfolk is a freshman who was a tight end in high school, played ha- basketball half the time. He's focusing fully on it for the first time, and he's uh, he's done admirably given all those circumstances. I would not feel comfortable with him facing it's Trace Jackson Davis or or Malik Renault for that matter, or any other bigs that Indiana has. So, uh, yes, Cliff, Cliff's performance will be huge on Saturday, uh, and I think this is going to be a really good test to see how much he really has grown uh, in the offseason. So I was just going to ask you just about the the depth overall. Is it? Do you feel like that's where Indiana maybe have its biggest advantage in this game, just with Trace Jackson Davis, Malik Renu, Race Thompson, Jordan Geronimo? Those are really four guys that they can use fifteen to twenty fouls and and play a little bit more aggressively. We saw that against North Carolina. They did have some foul trouble, but North Carolina really didn't have any depth behind Baycott, and when he had to go to the bench, it was basically Pete Nance trying to to guard Trace Jackson Davis or whoever was in the post, and that didn't work out too well. I just wonder from a Rutgers perspective, if Cliff does pick up fouls or can't play 32 to 35 minutes, how that works from a defensive uh, perspective for Rutgers. Yeah, defensively, I would be very alarmed for Rutgers. Um, Wolfolk, like I said, he's shown some signs on the offensive end, but he's really raw defensively, as you would expect from a kid who played basketball half half the time, probably focused more on being a tight end than he was a, as a center. Um, and then Dean Reber, who is had some really good flashes last season. He's been struggling early on in the year. He dealt with a foot thing, you know, about a month before the season started. And Pico says he's he's healthy and he's recovered and he's playing every game, but he just looks a step slow. And for a player who was already, you know, probably a step or two slow last season when he was healthy, that 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 that's not great. So I would not feel comfortable if I was Rutgers throwing those two guys in to defend Trace and Race and Malik and all those guys. But they really have no other option. They really don't have much quality depth behind Cliff. They really put all their eggs in the Cliff basket. And in their defense, it's probably kind of hard to convince a quality guy out of the portal to come play backup for a guy who you know is going to play 30 minutes a night, right? That's a that's a, that's a debacle, that, not a debacle, uh, uh, a situation that Rutgers had to deal with and really couldn't find a solution to, um, which works when Cliff is playing really well, obviously, because you have one of the best big men in the Big Ten. But when if he does get in foul trouble or he can't, he's having a bad night, that's most trouble behind him. So um, again, this will be a really good test for Rutgers in that sense. I think that Cliff is going to have to play out of his mind to even even that matchup out because like you said, Indiana is much, much deeper. We've seen Ron Harper Jr. and Geo Baker hit obviously a lot of tough big time shots over, over their careers at Rutgers. And obviously Ron Harper Jr. hit a shot last year at Assembly Hall that many people thought was going to keep Indiana from making the tournament, which obviously they went in the Big Ten tournament and were able to play their way in. But I, th- those two guys, you just they they absolutely torched Indiana over their career. How how big of a drop off has it been losing those two guys in terms of what they've replaced them with in the perimeter? You mentioned Cam Spencer and Hyatt, who obviously played at Rutgers last season after transferring from LSU. But has the level of play in terms of the other wing guys uh, kind of been a significant drop off, or have they held their own? I looked at. Hyatt's efficiency numbers. He, he looks like he's taking a lot of shots, but not necessarily shooting a high percentage. And and Spencer, you mentioned his numbers overall look good, but against the two high major opponents he's played, hasn't necessarily been uh, the greatest in terms of efficiency. I just wonder how long term you see those guys kind of filling in uh, for Harper Jr. and Baker. It's obviously going to be a drop off, but I think it's important for Rutgers to at least have some solid players behind kind of the big three uh, moving forward. Yeah, I agree. And it's tough to tell because like you said, they've only played two. They played one high major team on Wednesday and they played one mid-major in Temple. And then they played four or five tomato cans, frankly. I mean, UMass Lowell is not bad. They're 150 in Ken Palm, but still it's UMass Lowell, right? So it's very difficult to see how that translates. And we've seen, like like I mentioned, Cam Spencer lit up these terrible teams and he's had some struggles against these other teams. It's hard to know what is the reality or what is it the middle ground is, you know, 
Uh, to your point, they haven't found a guy. Like those two guys were the guys. You knew that if they needed a bucket in the last two minutes, they were getting the ball. And more often than not, they were making the shot. Rutgers doesn't have that guy. You can't depend on Cliff to do that. It's not fair to the guy. Uh, you're not going to ask a setter to, to create a shot off the dribble. And especially not when teams can just front him and not prevent the ball from going to him. And there's no guy. Cam Spencer has not shown an ability to create off the dribble. That's not really his game anyway. Um, Caleb McConnell can do that, but he's back for two games. And I'm not, I haven't seen him in that situation yet to say, I know he can do it. Uh, Andre Hyatt, like you said, he, he, he's been impressive. He's been better than people expected. I think people kind of wrote him off in the offseason, myself included. I didn't think he was going to be able to contribute like this, but he's still a ways away from being a guy who you can depend on. And Watt Mag, who a lot of people expected to have a breakout year at the four, he's been a bit disappointing, especially on the offensive end. He's been fine defensively, which is what Peichel really cares about, frankly. But he's been he's been blowing layups. He hasn't been shooting very well. Uh, he hasn't really contributed much on that end other than cleaning up some scraps off the offensive boards. So, yeah, the, the depth at wing defensively is fine. Offensively, I just – I haven't seen anything yet that – dissuades me from thinking that there there's a huge hole there left by uh, Ron Harper and Gio leaving, which like you said is to be expected, but they're going to need somebody, somebody desperately to, to step in. And um, I, I will, I'm, if you ask me who, who, who I would give the ball to in the last minute, if they need a bucket, I couldn't tell you a name right now. I really, I really couldn't. Eichel's style of play obviously isn't the most glamorous when you look at kind of how they play. They grind out games. They, you know, they they want to play in the fifties instead of, you know, a high scoring, high possession game. Uh, obviously, the results have been great. I, I just wonder, from a recruiting standpoint, what challenges that brings and and how um, Rutgers has been doing recruiting wise. Obviously, they've they've had some some good players come in like Baker and Harper and Amori, but looking towards the future. What what challenges I guess do they have from a recruiting perspective and, and looking down the line? Have they been recruiting better based on their success in recent years? Or are they still going to kind of be that that program that's maybe getting some you know fringe top one fifty players and trying to fill the gaps of the portal? Yeah, they've been recruiting better in the sense that they're getting higher profile kids interested in the program, showing up on official visits. Uh, they're, that's a step forward that fans point to. What's missing is locking those kids up, getting those kids to commit and seriously consider Rutgers. Because it's one thing to go on an official visit. It's another thing to really think long and hard about going there. Um, they got a kid. In the end of the day, I think they're going to have to get kids that fit Peichel's mold of, he loved, He loves to mention that Ron Harper Jr. went to one high school, had one AAU team, has a great family behind him. Those are the kinds of kids that Peichel gets. It's why he got Gavin Griffiths, who's a four-star kid, a top 50 kid. He's different than those other top 50 kids. He had one AAU team, went to one high school, has a great family who Pico has some connection with because his dad played in Connecticut high school circles at around the same time. That's not why the, the, that connection is not why he got him. But my point being that that's the kind of kid that Pico is going to get. I don't know if he's going to get a kid like uh, I, I'm struggling to get a name off the top of my head. A, a, a Dylan, Bailey, Dylan, for example. How about how about Dylan Harper? Well, he's he's more in that Gavin Griffiths mold in that right. He has they have a relationship there. They have a relationship with the family, obviously. His mother loves Rutgers, loves Steve Peichel, loves him. Uh, so that'll be big. Uh, and Dylan doesn't strike me as the kind of kid who is you know, chasing the the name, the the Indiana, the Duke, the the all these schools that are chasing him. I don't think he's allured by that big name thing. And I think the I think his mom has, has some pull with him. So I think Rutgers has a legitimate shot with Dylan Harper. But again, it's because of those previous relationships, because of the mold that that kid is in. Um, Tyler Betsy, a kid, for example, uh, who blew up, he's on Dylan Harper's AAU team. He blew up, got an offer from Duke, got offered by UConn. Rutgers was in it. I think that's kind of a kid that gets alerted by those those bright lights. And a lot of those kids are more like Betsy than they are like Harper. Um, so how much the style of play impacts the recruiting, that's hard to tell. I think they tell these, these kids that they'll have freedom on the offensive end, which I, I believe they do. I think Rutgers does allow these kids to have that. Uh, but I don't know how, how much that'll overtake the, the glitz and glamour of these other programs. So that's the next hurdle that Peichel has to overtake. But he's proven that I think he even is better at coaching these under-recruited kids who have a chip on their shoulder. That's more the kind of guy that he can kind of push and prod and and um, and uh, not worry about this guy getting mad at him for coaching him hard. So I, I think even those are the kids he, he prefers. Obviously, talent is more important, and Rutgers won't take the next step until they get that talent. 
But I think, like you said, Pico has maximized a lot of what he's gotten out of these kids. Geo Baker was the 400th ranked recruit in his class. I think Pico has shown that he can develop them. Now it's a matter of getting better kids that he can develop as well. Well, the other thing I'll say just about the Big Ten big picture, um, I've been covering the league for a long time, and you look at the recruiting rankings now, a lot of the McDonald's All-Americans are going to the ACC, they're going to the SEC, they're going to the Big 12. The Big Ten's hardly not getting any of those guys. I'm not saying they're not getting talented players. Obviously, Indiana got a couple this year, and Jalen Huchifino and Malik were new, but you look at what Wisconsin's done, you look at Purdue, even Michigan State to an extent, they're not getting necessarily a ton of five stars, but if you recruit kids that fit your program and you have a winning culture and a in a system that works, you can basic and, and you develop players. I think that's another thing that Rutgers has done relatively well. You can have success. You're you're right. Maybe it's not the high end success, but what Big Ten program is having that high end success? They haven't won a national championship in this league since the year 2000. I think overall for the health of the league, they need to get some of these higher ranked kids because that's ultimately how you win a national championship. But for where Rutgers is right now. I think they've done an excellent job uh, in terms of just identifying the players that fit their system and then coaching them up and winning a lot of games. Why do you think the Rutgers has been so successful against Indiana in the last eight games? Is it just they've been the tougher, more together team? I mean, seven and one. I looked at the all-time season series. Um, I always try to look at that. Our all-time series between the two schools, it's seven to seven now. So Rutgers could actually, if they win on Saturday, they could... Uh, they could they could be leading Indiana eight to seven, which is hard to believe. Um, but but why do you think just over the last eight they've they've really played so well against Indiana? Yeah, I think you nailed, nailed, hit the nail on the head. I think they they are the tougher team. I think they believe they're the tougher team. And you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned uh, earlier, the Joe Baker's comments on Field of sixty eight early, earlier this season that no one is scared of Indiana. I don't think Rutgers is scared of Indiana. I really don't. And uh, that's helped them mentally a lot in this. I think. Uh, even last season when that was a back and forth game, Indiana comes back, they, they tied the game late. I don't think Rutgers really worried about losing that game ever. Um, so that, that mental edge is huge. I think that win they had at the garden in the big 10 tournament a few years ago, they came back from 14 down. I think that's, that's something, I think that's something Michael could point to and say, we've done this. Like, look, they, they folded. I think it's fair to say they folded in the second half of that game. Right. So obviously that was Archie, Man- uh, Archie Miller, sorry, Archie Miller, right? Yeah. I'm not, Yes, <laughs> Archie we, 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 uh, uh, Indiana, Indiana fans have forgotten his name by now. Look at his look at his record so far at Rhode Island. Right, right. But uh, it's a different era. But it's, it's the same point. And I think I think this Indiana team is different. Um, and I think this Rutgers team might be a little different because they they lost Geo Baker and Ron Harper, who were the guys that could say, "Guys, we've done this before." But um, yeah, I, I think that's that's basically it. I think that Indiana has always been the more talented team. I don't think anyone could really dispute that. But Rutgers is just a better t- uh, a better collective, tougher, and they believe they can win these games. And I think they take it a little seriously too, because uh, India. I, I can't speak for the team. I don't know if the team is feeling this exactly, but I do think Rutgers fans at least have felt that Indiana disrespected Rutgers when they were in or in the early days of the Big Ten. Indiana fans were probably the most vocal about saying that Rutgers didn't belong in the Big Ten. And I, I, again, I don't know if it trickled that that trickled down to the team, but I do think that sentiment is kind of there that they wanted to prove we belong in the Big Ten. And if there's a team that we have to beat to do that, it's Indiana. And they've kind of just done that over and over and over again. Has Rutgers developed a rivalry at all within within the Big Ten with any other program? Or are they still kind of looking for a, a program that there is kind of their rival within the league? That's a good question. And I, th- I think that's how you define rivalries, right? It's if you ask what the fans think, and it, rivalries usually are two ways. I think Rutgers fans do have some sort of rivalry with Indiana. They feel it. I don't know if Indiana fan, fans feel the same way. Probably not, right? But I well, think, they might after going one one and seven in the last eight. I'm sure they really want to win the game Saturday, right, right? Right, and that's how kind of rivalries are built, right? And I think Rutgers fans really really get up for these games. I think Saturday is going to be a madhouse at the rack. I really do. Um, I think they had they've had some battles with Iowa. I don't know if it's necessarily a rivalry, but that that um, Joey's camp corner off the backboard three pointer to win the game at the rack oh, yeah. really rough people. I, that, that's that's something that people that will stick in your craw for a long time. Um, what else? Uh, Maryland, not really. Yeah, I, I think I don't think they've been around long enough. But I think you should play. They're on. I would say they're on pace to building these rivalries because as long as they stay this this competitive and they keep knocking teams off, you're going to piss off some other fan bases, and that that's how these things kind of brew and become rivalries. Last thing before we get you out of here, what's just in general, what's it like covering Steve Peichel as a coach? And, he, you know, I, I watched some of his press conferences. He, he, he's not the most 
uh, I guess, energetic guy, or, you know, he's not going to give, you know, a bunch of uh, quotes that you can plaster all over social media and get a bunch of retweets, but he just kind of seems like very businesslike in terms of how he runs his program, but he's he really understands kind of what it takes to win. I'm just curious from a reporter perspective, what it's like been covering him and um, kind of what, how maybe it differs from uh, the previous regime there. So I, I was, I can't really compare it to the previous regime because I was still learning how to be a reporter in the first place. I didn't right. have much of a report with them. Uh, but I will say Steve is like, Steve is very professional. He's very, uh, he's a great guy. If you get him off, off the camera, on the side, talking to him. He's a great guy, funny guy, very personable. Um, he gets a little tense when he gets on camera, especially after after games. But um, he's he's a good guy. He'll he does this thing after every game. He's done this after every post game that I've been in. He'll get off the podium and shake everyone's hand and thank them for coming. He's done that since Stony Brook. That's really his trademark thing. Uh, after every media day before the season, he'll send every reporter that was there a handwritten note thanking them for coming. That's really just his 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 thing. That's his style. Um, he, you're right. The quotes are hard at times. He refuses to individually praise players. Uh, it's that she just will thank, say everybody had a good game. He will go down the line at every press conference just to make sure everyone gets included. He's done that for years now. Um, so, which can be frustrating when, you know, a guy scores 35 points, has a game winner, and he's talking about how, you know, the 10th guy in the rotation had a key rebound in the second minute of the game or whatever. But that's just the way he operates. You can respect that. He wants to keep the locker room together. He wants to maintain harmony. And I think his players buy into that. I do think that a lot of these guys aren't out for individual glory and can buy into the team concept. It's just a little frustrating for us, but it is what it is. Um, but yeah, Steve is, Steve is a good guy. He's available a lot of the times. He's, uh, he opens the program up, lets us into practice. Uh, really no complaints. I think, um, I think he's, uh, he's been a good guy to cover and he's made the Rutgers basketball program a program that people want to cover because for a long, long time it was an afterthought. And now it's, it's, I'd argue the premier sport at the school. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a fun few years so far and I'm looking forward to seeing where the rest of the season goes. Brian, thanks for the time this week. Where can uh, where can IU fans follow your work this weekend when you cover the game? Uh, maybe if they want to get a a Rutgers spin on things and and kind of what what are you maybe looking forward to most just about the atmosphere tomorrow? Sure. Uh, so I, I write for NJ.com. Just go on NJ.com slash Rutgers. All my stuff is on there. Uh, my Twitter is uh, they're gonna have to take out a pen and write this down. It's B R I A and then four N's N N N N F. Uh, Long backstory on that. Actually, not really, but it's very boring. I won't get into it. Whatever. They 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 bust my balls every time I go on the radio about it. Whatever. Um, and I'm looking forward to this. Is gonna be the first real big atmosphere at, at the rack this season. I haven't been at a big game at the rack since last February, probably when they were rolling past those ranked teams. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to Indiana kind of dealing with that. I think it's the first time they're back at the rack in two years or three years actually, because uh, they weren't here last year, and then before that was the pandemic year. Um, I'm looking forward to watching this Indiana team in person. I really am. I think I picked them to win the league like most people did. And I'm sticking to that. I think they, them and Purdue were probably head and shoulders above everyone else. I don't know if you agree with me there, uh, but I'm looking forward to watching them. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, big games happening because as much as I enjoy covering Sacred Heart and Central Connecticut State, Indiana is going to be a lot more fun. So I appreciate the opportunity to be on. It's been really fun talking Rutgers Hoops with you, man. You guys, you guys do a great job at Inside the Hall. So uh, I'll be following your stuff for sure. Absolutely, Brian. Thank you for the time. And thanks, everybody, for listening uh, to our second episode, actually, a podcast on the brink this week. We will be back uh, next week at some point, either talking about a, an uh, 8-0 Indiana start or uh, a loss to, to Rutgers. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens this weekend. Uh, as always, if you enjoy the show, please leave us uh, a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or a rating on Spotify. We really appreciate that. And we'll be back soon with another episode of Podcast on the Brink.